If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. Advancements in automotive engineering came fast and furious in the 1920s. A lot of it driven by racing technology. And Cornelius Van Ranst is an engineer who worked for Miller and was a very instrumental part of the team that created the great front wheel drive Miller race cars that drove in all the championship races in the 1920s. And he started up his own shop and then was recruited by Everett Loban Cord to come and join his operation and to bring that technology to the passenger cars. Now, front wheel drive and all wheel drive was not new, but the idea of putting it into a series production car, especially for the upper market, the luxury market, was not really considered. And the Cord L29 is one of the pioneers. And this is a car that first strikes you, as most cars do, aesthetically. It's a beautiful car, long and low. And in fact, the lines of this car were made possible by the front wheel drive system. The fact that the car could be lower because it didn't have the drive shaft going through to the rear wheels and the concomitant chassis design to go with that gave the designers a great opportunity to create this very long, low design and the fact that you've got this 300 cubic inch Lycoming straight eight engine used in the Auburns reversed to power the front wheels also meant that it had to have a long hood, which of course gives a great aesthetic look. Now, aesthetics are one thing, but the driving experience is quite another. The Cordell 29 was a pioneer, but something that's not quite ready for prime time. Um, it was the first front wheel drive car to use constant velocity joints, which certainly assisted in handling because the wheels now turned in a way that allowed them to maintain contact with the road and grip as had not been seen in other front wheel drive cars. But because the car was so heavy, the CV joints frequently wore out and were a big durability uh, issue for the owners. The other thing is that today, when we are very used to sort of viceless front wheel drive cars, front wheel drive cars you don't even notice or know or care which end of the car is the driven end, in the L29 I have to say that you notice it. Um, this is an older restoration, so it's not fair to judge every L29 by the handling of, of this particular car, which is still a very good one, but you definitely feel the front end hunting around as you drive and as you apply power. And that was something that motorists of the time had to get used to. And the fact that this car is so incredibly nose heavy is not helpful, especially on uh, the heavily crowned country road and driving the sun now. Success would come to front wheel drive cars a few years later with the Citroën Traction. And that was a car that took the lessons learned in this one and applied them in a much lighter weight car, especially the four. The six cylinder Traction Avant have some of the vices that the, uh, the straight eight Cord have. But Cord really learned a lot of lessons with the next model after a hiatus of a few years that came out with the 810, the great Gordon Burig designed uh, example of the car, which really was able to deliver the kind of performance that this configuration deserved. And so the L29 remains a bit of a sort of glorious failure. Uh, elegant, advanced, daring, but ultimately not the most satisfying car of the period. But it's, it's an important thing, I think, to be able to experience cars like this 
to know what was capable, what the engineers dared to do in a time that being venturesome could frequently pay great dividends. And another reminder that things that are born on the track find their way to the street in sometimes surprising and very satisfying ways. Sitting in this car certainly is a wonderful experience. It's a very nicely designed seat. The dashboard is absolutely beautiful, very much of the period, the wonderful sort of Art Nouveau uh, aspect of the dash furniture is, is spectacular and great to see. And this is a car that still turns heads, and not surprisingly. The fact that this car couldn't be made to work better than it did is also, I think, an aspect of the time in which it was born. Of course, being born just before the Depression made an expensive car that was aimed at a very particular clientele that was rather conservative in its tastes. And another example of, while the American market was certainly the fastest growing automotive market in the 1920s and 30s, it was also a very conservative market, the market that rejected the Chrysler Airflow. And this Cord L29, when the Traction Avant the Peugeot 402 and the Fiat 1500 found acceptance in their homelands. One of the things which is also very interesting about this cord, of course, is this gear selection system in the dashboard, which uh, is also used in the Citroën de Chevaux, interestingly enough. And again, it's an interesting point because obviously you don't need to have that linkage going back through the floor with the front wheel drive system. But, like anything else, it takes getting used to. They also had a similar shift in the Morgan. And uh, it is convenient in terms of adding space inside the, uh, the interior. It does take some getting used to, shifting through the dashboard. But it is an interesting uh, point with this car. Seeing its, its great attributes, looking out of that long hood, you have the same aspect that you have in a lot of other elegant European designs. Thinking about cars like Lagandas and some Hispano Suizas and the like. It's quite interesting that you definitely feel the weight over the front wheels, which gives it, in a, in a, in a strange way, a very modern feel because of the weight and the steering. But on the other hand, it also has that, it's not vagueness because if we're vague, it would sort of not respond, but you just have to let the car do what it's going to do. And then you can gain some confidence in the handling. It does feel very different than other cars of the period when it comes to this aspect, that's for sure. And it's also important to realize, of course, that when this car was built, it was built for much more open roads than we can think of today. There's very little traffic, and if you could open this car up on a real wide road, it'd probably be a lot more satisfying than sort of a winding country road, which brings out a lot of the front wheel drive vices, shall we say. But the chassis feels really good. It feels nice and solid. It certainly feels like an expensive car. It's funny, whenever I drive a car that has similar driving characteristics to this, I always think back on watching old Hollywood movies. And I can never understand why the actors and actresses who were sitting in a car in a dolly uh, with the projection behind them would be so active at the wheel when, of course, in a modern car, you just sort of hold the wheel in the center and the car goes where you want it to go. 
but this is very much alive and reacting to the way the car moves is very important in driving the car. With every moment that you drive the car, you become more secure in it, but you always have to be very alert and involved in what's going on. And the design of the instruments, although quite elegant, do not make them particularly easy to read. Uh, the amount of time required to move down and, and read the speedometer and the other instruments, never mind the ones facing the passenger, which remind me of the latest advancements in uh, cars where Ferrari has that entire cluster of gauges for the uh, passenger to read. Uh, it's very similar <laughs> in that regard. I have to look to see what the passenger is monitoring at this moment. You get an interesting amount of uh, heat soak out of the engine as well as we're going along, which is not particularly unwelcome on a cool day like it is today. But I wonder what that uh, might be like in the summertime, probably somewhat less welcome. And I think that the Auburns, equipped with this very same engine, uh, feel somewhat more alive. And thinking about this engine with the uh, supercharging as it existed in the, uh, the Auburn, uh, might have also been a very interesting thing, although I can't imagine supercharging and its reaction to the front wheel drive. <laughs> that would have been very entertaining indeed. I think the later Cord chassis was much better equipped at handling that. And it's, it's great that uh, Eric Loeb and Cord stuck with the idea of using this technology and trying to make it work in a satisfying car. It was widely believed that what became the A10 Cord was intended to be a new Duesenberg model, uh, a smaller car after the Model J, but it was given to Ford instead. In any event, really glad that it was built. Although it might have been quite interesting also to see what a front drive Duesenberg might have been like. But all conjecture. This is a wonderful way to experience an historical moment and to look at what would come in the future for American front-wheel drive cars.